money on walking the tightrope without a safety net. I can't do this anymore. I'm sorry. Listen, God's got you. God's got you. You don't need a safety net when you have God. A lot of things you don't need in life when you have God because he is the fulfillment of every need. That's why he says, I am that I am. He is all that you need him to be. He is. All right. Now, I am going to quote a song real quick, and then we're going to read scripture, all right? God is the joy and the strength of my life. He removes all pain, misery, and strife. He promised to keep me, never to leave me. He never, never falls short of his word. I've got to fast and pray. Stay in the narrow way. Keep my life clean every day. I want to go with him when he comes back. I've come too far and I never turn back. God is. What is God to you? Well, I'm going to share with you what God is. One of the things God is to you. And I want you to go with me to Philippians chapter 4. 4, starting at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of one, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Let's deal with that real quick. There are times when you will abound. There are times in your life you will abase. There are times you'll be abundant. There are times you'll be, your money will be funny. Your change will be strange. But no matter what, when you are trusting God, you will learn to be content. If all you can eat is broccoli and top ramen for a week, you will learn all kinds of ways to put that baby together to make it tasty. <clears throat> so every time you eat it, you get to enjoy it. Listen, and then there are <coughs> and then there are times where you will be overabundant, and you get to splurge a little bit and enjoy. Well, guess what? It's life is like the waves of the sea. Blessings come in, blessings go out. Abundance comes in, abundance goes out. <laughs> Sometimes poverty comes in, poverty goes out. Whatever. <clears throat> the bottom line is your basic needs will always be met. Okay, verse 12. I know both how to abase, how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere, in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. See, if you never suffer need, you will never see God intervene. You will never see all the crazy ways he can provide for you. If you never suffer need, you won't know what it's like to have a miracle, like somebody standing in line paying almost $50 for the groceries that you put too many in your basket. If you never suffer need, you won't know what it's like to sit at a restaurant and a total stranger says, buy what you want when you're only there because you can afford a cup of coffee and that's it. And they tell you buy a meal and, and buy a second meal to take home. It's on me. Uh, <laughs> when you never suffer need, you don't see how God intervenes. It's, it's hard to explain, but you appreciate, you see God's hand. You see him reaching out and protecting you. You see him reaching out and providing for you. You see him doing things for you that you know if that were a normal situation, you would never have even gotten a heads up on it. And you got to jump on a blessing that only people that are really in the know would get that jump in. And why? Because God told you to look up on your computer. He's got something for you. See, when God has something for you, it is for you. 
When I was in the choir, they used to sing that. I don't know if you ever heard that song. What God has for you, it is for you. What God has for you, it is for you. I know without a doubt, he will surely bring you out. What God has for you, it is for you. It is for you. It is for you. It is for you. What God has for you, it is for you you. So my question is, do you believe that? 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. 14, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians also know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again unto my necessity. See, there he is thanking them for, for giving into his need because ministers live off of the gospel. Their work is the gospel. Okay, let's skip to, because I want to get to the bottom line. I don't want to lose you guys. I know how short attention spans are. Verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry. Listen, this last two months, money was tight because of the winter bills being high. They're always high. Money was tight. Do you know what God did? <laughs> I called Lynn. I had to tell her about it. I ended up with two months of credit where I didn't even have to pay. I think I paid the light bill maybe 19 bucks or the gas bill 19 bucks. I couldn't believe that I actually had a free, I mean, in this time of year, that usually happens one once a year in October. I actually got a reprieve and it gave me room to catch up a little bit. So what I'm trying to tell you is, yes, there are times you will go through tight squeezes. There are times where you will you will squeal your way through. It'll feel so tight you feel like you're in a straitjacket. But guess what? You can't let it get next to you. You can't let it wreck your nerves because I'm telling you, Every time you go through a tight spot, God releases the pressure and he bring, He makes a way where there is no way. But my question to you is, are you asking him? Are you leaning on him? Are you waiting on him? I don't mean waiting on him just doing nothing. What I mean is, are you waiting on him to do the impossible, the thing you cannot do. Now, there are some situations, listen, where I have placed myself in a tight. Like when I went through the graduation, I splurged more than I should have. It just felt good having, having a little room to wear, a little wiggle room. It felt good. And I was celebrating. But there are times when you put yourself in a position and you may have overspent over here, splurged over there, overdid it over, over yonder. <laughs> and you have to say, okay, God, I made a mess. Help me, help me, help me. I need a rescue now. I dug myself too deep. But guess what? You're acknowledging what you did wrong. You're acknowledging where you took it a little too far. So you have to take responsibility for what you did that was inappropriate for the time and ask God to forgive you. But 
while you're forgiving me, Lord, have mercy and come to my rescue. That's okay to do that. Just don't sit there. This is what a lot of people do. Don't say, if she hadn't done that at that time, I wouldn't have had to use that gas. And if he didn't need me at that time, I wouldn't have missed out on this. Side. And everything is everybody else's fault but yours. Some of you mishandle your money 24-7. Your credit is in the toilet because you're emotional shoppers. You're emotional buyers. Everything is on an impulse. And you don't think bills first before fun. So yeah, some of us will get over inundated because we overdo it. But our bills are paid, baby. Those bills get paid before we overdo a thing. Some of you, you overdo it and then worry about the bills later on. Let the chips fall where they may. Then when they keep falling and you're under a, a barrage of debt, then you're crying out in anger because you're wondering why God isn't coming to your rescue when he, his rescue might have been, don't buy that. You're going to need that for this bill. I had him do that with me. I saw a dress I wanted so bad. It wasn't expensive. It was only maybe 30 or 40 bucks. And I was getting ready. I said, Lord, Lord, can I get it? Can I get it? Can I get it? Yeah. And the Lord said, no. And I was like, oh. I didn't like that. I didn't like that answer. And no, I did not agree with the Lord either. But guess what? I obeyed him. I kept that little money in my account. And what happened? A surprise bill came through that only comes through every year. And I forgot it was on its way. I forgot the time of year it was. And had I bought that dress, it would have been an overdraft. That's why he says, acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your path. But remember to take responsibility. Don't point the finger out there. Every time you point one finger out, you got one, two, three, four fingers pointing back at you. Three fingers, because the thumb points up. <laughs> But every time you point that finger out, you got at least three fingers pointing back at you. So be careful about getting an attitude. Be careful about getting frustrated. When you find yourself getting frustrated, you're encumbered with the cares of this world. What does God say about your cares? Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. That's not for you to carry. What does Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, here's the part where this is where the, I would say the nitty gritty, uh, the, the rubber meets the road. This is it right here. The biggest issue with most of us is never having experienced God one-on-one. -on -one. When you don't know him, you could be born again, filled with the Holy Ghost, that with a mighty burning fire, power and everything going on. But when you've never met the giver of the ghost, when you've never met the lover of your soul, when you never met the lifter up of your head, you are always encumbered with questions. Will he? Will he? Does he? Is he? It, there's a whole bunch of questions there because you're not at the point where you know him. See, when you know him, you can believe in him more. Here's another, here's another deficit for some of you. Some of you have never been raised by a faithful father, a responsible parent. You have parents or you have a parent or a guardian who says they're going to do something in a spur of the moment. And then in the next moment, they forget all about what they told you they were going to do. Uh, I'm going to take you to Disneyland next Saturday. 
I'm going to take you to Coney Island next month in May or June. Month in June, July, August, all, all these months go by. And you're like, well, well, what about, don't bother me. I got bill issues, boy. Don't bother me, girl. But, but you said that, <sighs> and you go through life with broken promises. And because of that, you have issues with trust. So when you've learned that people are so untrustworthy, the ones, the guardians of your life, the ones who were supposed to be there for you, who are supposed to provide for you, it makes it that much more difficult to trust an, an invisible God you've never seen, touched, nor experienced. The first thing I tell everybody you got to do, constantly ask God, reveal yourself to me, manifest yourself to me. I want you to be my friend, not some invisible entity I'm trying to believe in. I want to know that you love me, not hope that you love me. I want to know that you're for me, not hope that I'm on your good side at this moment. See, when you know God, it's like a parent. You know when they're happy with you and you know when they're not. I remember one night I was driving home, crying my eyes out. And I felt, I was crying because I felt the anger of the Lord. And boy, when I felt that anger, I started asking God to please have mercy. I will do whatever it takes. And I did too. I got my happy hips in, in alignment with his will. And I asked him not only for his forgiveness, but I asked him for his mercy. <laughs> Let this not go any further than right here. Please don't be angry with me anymore. I will do what it takes. That scared me. See, that's the other thing that's missing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Many people do not fear God because they have not learned to, <clears throat> to, they have not learned to respect levels of authority. Starting at home, if you slap your mama and cuss your mama out, if you knock your pops down on his can, and you do what you're, you know, good and well pleased to do, and they got a total line by your desires, then guess what? You're not going to have the ability, unless God puts a fear in you himself, you're not going to have the ability to fear God because you don't fear anything. You're entitled to whatever you have in your mind. I deserve this. I deserve that. I'm supposed to have. I'm supposed to have. No. That, that right there will make you very ungrateful, very unthankful. You'll be a murmurer and a complainer. And God, well, if he doesn't, if he's not your bellhop, if he doesn't step and fetch, is if he doesn't obey your every command, you ain't got time for him because you got to go get folks that are going to fulfill what you need out of life and what you want, what you so well deserve. Well, that's part of why some things go lacking in our lives. There are times when God is trying to get us to cry out to him that much more. When we are in need, we cry out to God. They say there are no atheists in foxholes. Mm, the bullets, those bombs, those grenades are flying. Folks that never want to hear the name of God will start crying out to a God they don't even believe in. Need, necessity. Sometimes God will allow that to draw you back into his bosom. He's trying to get us to be as close to him as possible. You can't hear a person's heart throb unless your ear is right up on their shoulder, I mean on their chest. You can't hear their stomach growl unless you're right up next to them. But let me tell you, God wants us to, I call it being right up under his armpits. He wants us to be right there. In his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence 
is fullness of joy. Why is it most of the saints don't have joy all the time? Why is it most of the saints are so unsatisfied? Why is it most of the saints are so frustrated with life? Why is it so, so many saints are depressed and empty? How can you be empty when you're full of God? It's an oxymoron. It's impossible. You cannot be empty and full of God at the same time. Something is missing. Something has gone wrong somewhere. And it's not with God. All right. Let's move on. Ooh, I felt that one. Let's go to Psalms 37. Psalms 37. Now you're going to get the word. So for those of you who don't like hearing Bible reading, I'll try to read it as interestingly as possible. But, but don't tune out on this one. This is a heavy duty one right here. Very comforting. Very reassuring. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. You know how mad we get, how the rich people get richer and the poor people seem to get poor and the rich are getting rich off of the backs of the poor and they could care less about the poor that are making them rich. Yeah. And the evil schemes that they do, the laws and the, the, the things that they put out there to make themselves richer and richer. Two. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Because we don't see it, we think that God is turning a blind eye. No, baby. This is here. Eternity is a whole nother, is a whole nother bill they got to pay. And that bill never gets paid. All right. Three, trust in the Lord and do good no matter what. You do good because, see, when you look at other people, who are doing wrong and they getting over like a fat rat. They getting over, baby. You start wondering, well, maybe if I hit the, the one-armed bandit, maybe if I go to Vegas, maybe if I play the lotto, maybe if I do this and do a little bit of that, I'll see what they doing and I'll slide in on their turf and see if I can make it too. No. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt. Be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. You know, let, let me say this real quick. Delight thyself in the Lord. Listen, some of us delight ourselves in YouTube. Some of us delight ourselves in our lover. Some of us delight ourselves in and hustling up some 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 ducats. It's called money. Some of us delight ourselves in that bottle of liquor. And we delight ourselves in gossip. We delight ourselves in entertainment. But God, that's boring. No, he's not. Not when you experience him in the fullness of of his glory and the fullness of that supernatural galactic love. Oh my goodness, when you see the beauty of the Lord, whoo, you don't see it physically. You see it in your soul. You feel it. You experience him. And I'm telling you, when you experience God, there is no other that surpasses that experience. No other, no climax under the sheets, no high from that needle or that white powder. There's nothing out there that can compare to where God can take you. No high like the high in God. No high, nowhere. <clears throat> okay. God can keep you high too. See, when you go high off of this temporary crack, you crash. It's like a lot of people talk about when they go on crack. When they go high, they go high. But boy, when they crash, they, <laughs> they hit rock bottom. Well, with God, he can sustain you in a nice level of high. So you can deal with the vicissitudes of life and not get your feathers ruffled. Not get shaken by the winds of adversity. 
not get trampled down by the weight of your worries, woes, and fears. You won't have those worries, woes, and fears when you're trusting God because trust removes the need for worry and fear. All right. Trust in the Lord and do good. No matter what you're tempted to do, no matter how you see your buddy getting over, don't you get off on, on in the wrong lane doing what they do. Don't do it. You keep doing good because your promises, so shalt thou dwell in the land and verily thou shalt be fed. God will take care of you. Will, not might. Will, not sometimes. Will always take care of you. Four, delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Listen, when I first got saved, I went through a lot of necessity, a lot of being abased, and being taught by the word that I had to make my, I had to pray for God to help me be content, even when I saw everybody else with the fine rides and the nice clothes being able to go here, travel over there, and fly there at the drop of a hat. They could just come and go as they want. And I'm sitting up here, I, I, I just got the money to pay my bills. And I'm always responsible, so I pay my bills. But I don't get to go anywhere, because I don't have that kind of money. Well, guess what? That was frustrating. I wondered, when was I going to get somebody who loved me the way I wanted to be loved? That was frustrating. And I wondered, well, Lord, when am I ever going to get anything happening with my ministry? When is this going to happen? When is that going to happen? When am I going to have nice things? Why do I always have to do without? Why do I always? It was like a mantra. <clears throat> I was whining and complaining, and one day the Lord led me to scripture. That's why you got to get in this word, y'all. He'll change your attitude. The situation may not change, but he'll change you in the situation. And once you make that 180 degree change, he'll say, pass, next class, and you can come on up out of that. But the longer you murmur, the longer you cop an attitude, the longer you give in to wrath, the longer you give place to Satan while you're going through, the longer you let your mouth and your attitude go where it has no business going, you will repeat that class over and over and over and over and over, and you will feel like those dogs you see that chase their tail, spinning around, getting nowhere fast, getting nowhere. You got me going in circles. Diddy, diddy, diddy. Going round and round I go. Yeah, that's the way you feel about God. He got you going in circles. No, your attitude has got you going in circles because it's not the situation. It's how you handle the situation. All right. Delight thyself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Now, I can't pushing and pushing and pressing in, pressing in, being faithful in the choir, being faithful in overcomers meetings and, and leading those, those, those lessons for the men and the women, being faithful to prison ministry, being faithful when I barely had gas to get there and get back, being faithful when I only had two hours sleep and they called me at the last minute to come to prison ministry because somebody decided at the last minute they couldn't come or wouldn't come. And now, look how God has abundantly blessed. I have the man of my dreams, the car of my dreams, the house of, I mean, everything. I had to go to the hospital. God has done a healing. It took years, but he's done a healing, teaching me different ways of eating. Some things are progressive, y'all. And you've got to walk in the steps he lays ahead of you in order to benefit as much as possible. In a fallen world, he can be rising you up. 
but you have to humble yourself in the hand of the Lord so he can exalt you. You've got to humble yourself and cry out for help. Lord, I'm messed up over here. I'm messed up over there. I'm underdeveloped over here. Lord, I'm weak in this area. Help me, please. Strengthen me on my weak side. Straighten me up. Prop me up. Carry me, whatever. But help me get through this. So I can come out on the other end better than I went in. Five, commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. I'm telling you, when you commit it all to him, when he goes against your better understanding, when you don't agree with him, when you're leaning to your own understanding, but you choose to trust in his word rather than what your gut tells you, it'll work out in the long run so much better. Six, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Seven, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Rest in the Lord. How do you rest? How do you rest? Think of the Lord as a recliner. You kick back, you kick your feet up, your whole body, all your weight is leaning on that chair, trusting it will not fall apart under your weight. And I'm not a lightweight, y'all. But you're resting in the Lord. You're waiting patiently for him. Now, waiting patiently doesn't mean you don't do anything. There was a time when I got tired of being in the workplace. And I leaned up against my dining room table. It wasn't no long prayer. I didn't fast and pray for two or three, four months. I was leaned up against the table. I knew God was right there. He could hear me whether I spoke or not. And I just said casually, Lord, if I were to ask you what I should do with my life, what kind of living you know I would enjoy? If I know I got to work, <clears throat> but most of these jobs I don't enjoy. What would be the thing I would really love doing not have to work for someone else, set my own schedule, set my own pay, not have to ask permission to go pee. I mean, come on. What would you tell me to do? If I went back to school and took a course to prepare myself for another type of a career, what would you tell me to do? Now, in my mind, I was looking at illustration because I love doing artwork. So I thought maybe if I take graphic arts and illustration, maybe that'll give me a good living. But again, I'd be working for someone. I wanted to be self-employed, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as I said, what would you tell me to take? I saw a sign, a vision of a sign appear right up, right up near my ceiling in an arch. C-O-S-M-E-T-O-L-O-G-Y, cosmetology. What? I wasn't thinking nowhere in that arena. But here's the crazy part. I had been doing a little side hustle doing braids and weaves. That was just a little side money. I didn't take that seriously. Do you know God blessed me to pay off a house, buy two cars, pay them off doing that? At owning my own salon after a while. All this stuff happened as a result of me asking God a question, getting an answer, and walking by faith into that answer, even though it wasn't the answer I wanted. <clears throat> but by the fourth day taking that class, I knew I was in my element. I was like a fish in water, y'all. Yeah, this is me. I love this. Mm -hmm. 25 years. Self-employed. Loving it. My husband was amazed at how much I loved what I did. So, and the reason he knew it was because I bought him a recliner. So he could sit. When I got my own salon, I bought a recliner for him. Two, one for the house in the living room and one 
for the salon. So when he got off of dialysis, if I wasn't finished working, they'd bring him straight to the salon so he wouldn't be at home alone. And I'd be right there in case he needed anything. And he could sit in the recline. I had a little TV. He could sit in that little back room and watch TV and relax. The window was open. If he needed something, all he had to do was call. I'd peep through the window and see what was up and go meet his need. I mean, God just put everything together. But my question to you is, are you asking? Sometimes we, <clears throat> we want to do things our way because this is the way we know it. We want to do things our way because this is the way it's always been. We don't like stepping out on unknown turf. We want to do more. We want to make more. We want to be more replenished. We want to be compensated more, but we don't want to trust God to get out there and have a self-employment. No, we want a boss. But you're asking God to provide. So why not let God be your boss? When people came to my salon, they knew who my boss was. My boss was God. Wasn't no human being. It was God. We had Christian music playing in there morning, noon, and night. We had little trinkets up on the wall, decorations. Everybody knew my salon was a Christian shop. And if they didn't like it, they can turn around and walk out. My question to you is, are you committing your way to the Lord? Are you really trusting him? Okay, let's move on to verse 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. That's where I left off. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. You know, don't worry about them. That's their business. You let God deal with that business. You handle yours. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do you know why you get angry and wrathful? The, my husband could always tell when I was grumpy. I had explained it to him before when it happened. So he kind of could tell. He saw the pattern after a while. If he saw me getting a little grumpy, he said, baby, yeah. Are you worried about the finances? Yeah. That started happening when the real estate crash hit. Now, what God showed me was that I was putting too much pressure on myself instead of leaning on him that much harder. Well, that was something I had to make an adjustment and where I couldn't actually do it on my own. I needed his help and I asked for his help. And I noticed the more I leaned on him, the less I fretted. The more I leaned on him, the less I get angry. Honestly. So it, it's hard because we have to go through that process of not depending on self and depending on him. Some people, I noticed, this is, it's like a psychological thing. Some people have it, find it very difficult to ask for a discount. They, they might be a senior, but they don't want to ask somebody, do they give senior discounts? They're ashamed to ask. Some people are afraid to ask for a ride. They're afraid to ask somebody to just lend them 20 bucks till tomorrow so they can put gas in their tank. Let me, let, let me show you how I trust God. And I'm not the standard because there are people that trust God way more than I do. And I don't know if I'll ever get to that level, but um, I'm trying. Let's just say that. I was on my way to the bank the other day and my, my battery was dead. And when I looked at the clock, I said, I got to get in there by five. So I left my house. It was 20 minutes to five. <laughs> Yes. And I had to walk there. So I'm walking and I'm looking at my cell phone to see what time it is. And I said, okay, I want to make sure I get in that door before they shut. I said, Lord, supply me a ride to get me there on time. And a guy pulls up. I don't know this man. A guy pulls up uh, at the stoplight. I mean, at the stop sign. I'm crossing 
and he's waving me nicely to go on, no problem. And I waved at him, thanks. And then as soon as I got across, I saw his window was open. So I said, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah. I said, you're turning right here, right? He said, yeah. I said, I got to get to the bank. Can you just take me one block? That's all I need. The boy took me all the way to the bank. And I was able to get out. I offered him gas money. He would not take it. I was at the bank on time. Now, I wasn't trusting that man. First thing I did was, God, is it safe? I felt a total peace. So I had the balls to ask. I didn't have to be embarrassed. The Bible says sometimes we have not because we ask not. Some of y'all are too embarrassed to ask. What does that embarrassment come from? Pride. Sometimes you got to ask for help, y'all. All right, here we go. Eight, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do a, to do evil. See, we get angry sometimes. You know, remember, like I said, my husband said, are you worried about the finances? I wasn't mad at him. I was just grumpy. He could tell I was grumpy. I'd be fussing at the drivers on the road. Why don't you move over? If you're not going to drive, park the dog on car. You know, he crack up laughing at me. Nine, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring this to an end, I promise you. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, they shall diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Where is your peace, y'all? Y'all tied up in knots. You're bored to death. You're frustrated to death. You're empty. Where is your peace? Where is the gratification? Where is the satisfaction? Where is your, your, your joy? 12. The wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, for he seeth that his day is coming. Have you ever sat down and made yourself a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, a cup of chocolate? Put it on the side of your chair, kick your feet back on the porch or in your living room or in the kitchen or wherever you are. Got comfortable, kick your feet up on another chair, however you get comfortable. And say, Lord, and just start chit-chatting. Not a formal, oh God, oh merciful God in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, oh great merciful Lord and Father in heaven, I pray thee, blah. No, what about kicking back, having a chit-chat with him? Some of those chit-chats can last two or three hours. Before you know it, you're looking at the clock. Oh my God, where did the time go? You were kicking back, fellowshipping, communing with your father. That's very meaningful to him. Everything doesn't have to come in a bunch of prayer requests and formal prayers. The same way you have a conversation with your closest friends, those are the kind of conversations you should be having with God. Take a little time to shut up so you can see if he's got something to say to you. He might lead you to a scripture that might solve a quandary that you've been dealing with for a while. He might remind you of something you need to do that day by a certain time and you forgot all about it. Just by sitting down, taking a moment to spend with him. Okay, here we go. Whew. Let's drop down. I want to I wanna go down a little further for the sake of time. 18, the Lord knows the days of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. Don't y'all worry about provision. 20, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke they shall consume away. You ever fry bacon? I haven't had bacon for about 40 years, but you ever fry bacon and you see how smoky that fat gets when it's, or, or pork chops or something that's got fat on it, steak, and you see how that fat just puts up so much smoke? Yeah, that's what he's talking about. That's what he's going to do with the wicked. 
The wicked borrows and payeth not again, but the righteous showeth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Are you asking? And he delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have seen the young, and now I'm old. I'm going to stop here. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I'm done right there. Can you stand on that word? Can you lean on God that much harder when it seems like you can barely hold yourself up? Let God be your supply. Let God be your source, your, your material source. Let him be your spiritual source. Let him be your mental, your emotional source. Let him be your all in all, y'all. He sticks closer than a brother. When you need comfort, he should be the first one you run to, not the last resort. 